At the end of the 20th century, networks shifted from the background of the natural world to the forefront of everyday life. In this globalized world, infrastructure networks are vital. Businesses, personal and professional relationships, entire economies depend on dynamically networked technology. One new network has had an unparalleled impact on society, the World Wide Web. The World Wide Web and the internet on which it lives and grows has become an integral part of life. It has changed how we learn, shop, even socialize. And it's brought network concepts like connectivity into the lives of every surfer. This idea that you're actually walking in a landscape made of information, which was really one's experience on the early web, I think really drove home the, to, to people the idea that when you navigate information, when you're doing is exploring a network. Human interactions are increasingly being mediated by computers that leave a digital record. So the World Wide Web study offered us the first chance to look at the real system, how it looks like, what is its structure, how the nodes are connected to each other. And it was a hugely eye-opening experience for us. The World Wide Web houses a wealth of network data with information about connectivity already stored in powerful computers, ready to be explored. In 1999, a young physicist named Albert Laszlo Barabashi was making a map of the web when he made a discovery that would spark another revolution in network science. He found that the distribution of hyperlinks did not agree with the predictions of random graphs. We had to measure distribution to get the precise parameters of it so that we can predict if the web is disconnected or fully connected. The surprise was that when we actually got the distribution, it didn't look anything like an, uh, like an exponential Poisson distribution, but had this power law shape to it. Random graph models predict that the distribution of links should decrease exponentially in degree. Barabashi found that the hyperlink distribution fell off like a simple power law, much more slowly than with random connectivity. Networks with power law degree distributions have no characteristic scale, no typical degree belonging to a large portion of nodes. Barabashi called these networks scale-free. If a network has a power of degree distribution, it means that the vast majority of the nodes are very small, a few act as hubs that are very, very large, there's a continuous distribution between them, and there is no single node that you could pick out and say, this is typical in the system. They have a high variability in the degree of the nodes. So if I want to ask how many connections does each node have, I find that it has a huge range of variability. So I have some nodes with very few connections, and then or I have typically many nodes with very few connections. And I'll have one or two nodes that have massive connectivity. A power law degree distribution is not just a statistical signature, but a structural signature that, at least potentially, can tell us something about the history of a network, how the network came to be formed. Barabashi was astonished. Why does the World Wide Web deviate so much from the predictions of random graphs? The random models were too simple. Random graphs are static and randomly wired. But the World Wide Web is not random and it's certainly not static. It is a complicated, evolving organism with millions of web pages created and destroyed each day. This evolution must play a crucial role in determining the web's structure. Pages are being put on the web all the time and people are making links and breaking links to different pages. So the web itself is evolving day by day, minute, sec, probably second by second. We had to understand how networks emerge. And it turns out that the power law is very, very deeply connected to the history of the network. Barabashi proposed a model for these evolutionary mechanisms. 
a simple algorithm for network growth that explains how nodes decide which connections to make. It's based on the old idea that popularity attracts. In the web, nodes are more likely to connect to popular nodes. A chef is more likely to link his page to the food channel than cheesemistress.com? Barabashi created a simple graph model that grows according to this preferential attachment. He found that the resulting graph has a power law distribution, just like the web. If a website has a lot of links, there are, in other words, a lot of people link to that website, then you're quite likely to find it as you surf around the web. And then if you find it and you think it's a good website, maybe you'll link to it as well. So the ones that already have a lot of links tend to get more links, and the ones that have few, you're less likely to find those ones. If these, condition, these two conditions are present, that is, the network is growing and there is some mechanism that generates preferential attachment to the network, then very, very likely the network will be scale-free. It was a crucial discovery, but the idea was not entirely new. Famous polymath Herbert Simon was one of the first scientists to think about interdisciplinary complexity. In 1955, he developed a general theory of growth processes. He found that when components are added to a system, at a rate proportional to the ones already there, a power law distribution is formed. He provided a mathematical explanation for an old intuition about evolving systems. The rich get richer. It goes back um, all the way to biblical times. So there's a quote in Matthew, and uh, in sociology it's known as the Matthew Edict. And it says, for everyone that hath shall be given. So this bias towards the more connected nodes generates a rich gets richer mechanism. And as a result, the hubs will maintain their status. Not only will they maintain their status, but they become faster, bigger than the smaller nodes. In 1965, information scientist Derek DeSola Price applied Simon's theories to citations in scientific journals. He created a directed network model of citation based on this rich get richer attachment process and used his model to explain the distribution of citations in scientific literature. Thirty-four years later, Barabashi did the same thing for the web. His scale-free model of preferential attachment reproduces many distribution properties of the web and other scale-free networks. Lots of, you know, network-specific processes take place in, in these real networks. But as long as these two ingredients are there, which are very minimal requirements in the system, then the network will converge to the scale-free state. So the reason perhaps why we see so many scale-free networks out there is because the condition for their emergence is very minimal. One thing that people found kind of surprising with um, a lot of these scale-free parallel networks is that the, uh, the average shortest path actually stays constant or shrinks even as the network grows. So if you look at the internet backbone, you're adding more and more routers and so perhaps your packets need to make more and more hops, but that's not the case actually. The discovery that many networks are scale-free has inspired scientists to refine network models and to gather richer data. And it has sparked an influx of ideas from statistical physics and other disciplines, bringing a new perspective to network questions. You've got two networks that both have an exponential degree distribution, but they could have completely different assortativity. And that, again, is getting at more details, fine-grained structure um, that can be very important to look at. A router, if I make more connections to it, I'm only limiting the quality of any connection that it has. It has limited resources. So this idea of preferential attachment doesn't take into account at all uh, constraints on resources. In the following lesson, you'll learn more about the scale-free model, as well as its refinements and alternatives. You'll also learn about the new ideas and methods that have emerged in network analysis from efforts to understand network evolution.